Everyone, let's go ahead and get started. Dr. Brennan will be presenting uh, the speakers, but before we do that, um, just a reminder that next week, uh, Dr. Silvio Inzuki is giving grand rounds, um, and also this week, uh, we have some uh, a candidate visit, uh, uh, and so if you can, uh, particularly the faculty, if you can attend uh, the noon conference tomorrow, that would be appreciated. Um, Joe? Thanks. I'm the uh, right-handed reliever here, coming out of the bullpen. Uh, just uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I usually don't stand up in front of here, but today uh, we have a very, very, very timely topic on the uh, antiplatelet regimen following PCI or with acute coronary syndrome. We have a panel of three outstanding clinical fellows. We have Jennifer Kwan presenting uh, Clopidogrel. We have Sam Reinhardt presenting Ticagrelor. And we have the winner, Catherine Clark, <laughs> <laughs> presenting Prasigril. Uh, all have done an extraordinary job in researching this. They've spent a lot of time looking up the, the comparative data. Uh, the winner will be decided not in a uh, fist to cuffs, but hopefully in a very kind manner. Uh, but I think the first person to speak is Jennifer. Uh, and then Ari Amani, I know, has mentored her. Thank you very much for the introduction, Dr. Brennan. So I'm Jennifer Kwan, one of the second year cardiology fellows, and we were tasked with arguing in favor of one of the three major antiplatelets who are on the market. And I'm going to present why Plavix is the superior antiplatelet on multiple parameters. My mentor is Dr. Ari Amani. This is one patient that I actually saw, 60-year-old male, African-American, Hypertension, CKD, diabetes, admitted for NSTEMI, had a drug looting stent to the RCA, started an aspirin to cagalorin and atorvastatin, had GI bleeding requiring transfusion. GI workup didn't really find a definitive source, but since he had a fresh stent, in the meantime, he was switched to Plavix, and bleeding did not recur. So these are all the trials comparing uh, various antiplatelets over the years uh, for coronary artery disease and ACS. Plavix started them off uh, back in 2001. Certainly there were some trials with Ticlodbean, but that antiplatelet was discontinued due to a lot of adverse side effects. So Plavix still has been able to carry the field, uh, starting with Cure and then Commit and Charisma in terms of addition of an antiplatelet to DAPT therapy, it was shown to significantly decrease MACE in ACS patients. And even with the advent of newer antiplatelet regimens, including Prazegrel and Berlinta, the Plavix has still been able to maintain its share uh, and also has significantly reduced risk of bleeding compared to the newer antiplatelet agents. <clears throat> and also, I will be able to show some information in regards to why that could be. So these two antiplatelets were compared during a time when the older stents were around. And there is some new information that suggests that the newer stents actually have comparable effect between the antiplatelets. Additionally, Plavix also has a ph pharmacogenomics tailoring ability, and that has, could also be contributing to the difference of efficacy that we saw uh, between the older and the new antiplatelets. So this is the P2Y12 use uh, at YNHH uh, from January to December 2018, 10,693 patients uh, were evaluated, and you can see majority of the patients were on Plavix. Uh, so there are multiple parameters for which why Plavix reigns, including bleeding risk, frequency, uh, not having to discontinue due to bleeding or shortness of breath, pharmacogenomics, tailoring, and cost. Plavix is a prodrug. It gets metabolized in the liver, uh, activated by the CYP2C19 system uh, in order to affect its antiplatelet activity. And based off of the CYP2C19 activity, you can get poor metabolizers uh, of Plavix, uh, leading to ultra-rapid metabolizers, and that corresponds with drug response. Uh, so you can see variability in terms of platelet aggregation, variable response to Plavix, depending on genetic <coughs> allele of the CYP2C19 genes, 
loss of function of CYP2C19 gene, particularly STAR2, STAR3, leads to uh, hypo morphs where the patients do not get antiplatelet activity with Plavix. So starting with bleeding risk, which antiplatelet has the safest bleeding profile? So we're all trying to work towards this therapeutic window, this sweet spot where in ACS, we're trying to prevent the platelets to clump together uh, to promote further disease, but we're also trying to avoid bleeding risk as well. Bleeding risk has high mortality, similar to myocardial infarction. Major bleeding requiring transfusion has even more mortality than the myocardial infarction itself. And the PLATO trial, patients were treated with bare metal stents or first generation stents and was shown to decrease absolute risk of MACE by two, about 2%. Trade-off was significantly more bleeding seen in PLATO, but also in FDA analysis of the PLATO trial patients. So what about Tacaraglor versus Clopidogrel with the newer generation stents? This was an observational study, the change app study, where they were comparing Plavix versus Berlinta and one year follow-up looking at death, MI, bleeding, and also revascularization, stent thrombosis, and found that after propensity-adjusted scoring, Plavix had significantly <coughs> lower NACE at one year follow-up, also significantly lower stroke, significantly lower bleeding, uh, and they concluded that Berlinta tacagrelor <coughs> is increased with adverse event uh, in the newer stents for ACS patients. In an FDA analysis of the Plato patients, Plavix was shown to be significantly safer in terms of bleeding. Berlinta tacagrelor had significantly increased risk of major bleeds, also intracranial bleeding, which led to death, and also had non-procedural spontaneous bleeds that was higher than Plavix, uh, including gastrointestinal and epistasis. And these were a comparison of the three trials looking at Tacagalor versus Plavix, Prasugrel versus Plavix, and also Trilogy is Prasugrel versus Plavix. And we can see that the newer generation antiplatelets have significantly increased risk of bleeding, major bleeding, life-threatening bleeding. Um, and we see this uh, absolute risk reduction of the MACE uh, about 2%. So what about the Trilogy ACS? These were using the first generation stents, and Trilogy ACS incorporated newer generation stents. And when that happened, we see that there was no significant difference in MACE. And interestingly, there was also no significant difference in increased risk of bleeding, at least between Prasugrel and Plavix as well in that trial. So what about frequency? We know that as we increase the frequency of dosing, we decrease adherence. Compared to twice a day dosing, once a day dosing has 14% higher adherence. And Twice a day dosing has four times the amount of dosing mistakes. Once a day dosing reduces that and also has been associated with fewer days without medication. Plavix is a once a day, Tacagalor is a twice a day dosing. So what about discontinuation secondary to bleeding or sh shortness of breath symptoms? So we see here that P2R12 inhibitors, particularly Tacagalor, which has an ATP structure, gets metabolized in the gut and forms adenosine which can lead to dyspnea, bronchospasm, agitation, anxiety, and lead to ventricular pauses. Uh, it can also increase uric acid production and creatinine as well. And these are just a summary of the percentages associated with these newer antiplatelets, particularly to Cagalor, on some of these adverse side effects. So 14% dyspnea, 5% for Prasugrel. And also in the PLATO trial, we also saw that to Cagalor was discontinued more than Plavix statistically significant for adverse events or because the patient was unwilling to continue. Uh, we also saw dyspnea was higher, uh, relative ratio was 1.5 higher compared to Plavix in terms of dyspnea. And in a meta-analysis of from 2007 to 2017, we saw that of 16 trials, we saw that in general, the dyspnea and drug discontinuation favored the use of Plavix. At YNHH, for a pharmacogenomic study of ACS patients in 2018, there were 30% of patients who were discharged on Tacagalor that got switched to Plavix after discharge. So what were some of those reasons for, being, for discontinuation? 45% cited dyspnea, 25% was due to cost, and then other adverse events was 15%, 2% was non-compliance. 
So pharmacogenomics tailoring, I'm going to let Dr. Mani provide you some insights in terms of why this is so important. Jennifer has done such a good job, I didn't even have a place here. Uh, and, but I'm going to pick a few points that have been actually important to me and uh, most of you. And that is actually uh, go over a little bit of the, the uh, uh, pharmaco uh, the dynamic of uh, clopidogrel. It's actually a irreversible P2Y12 uh, in inhibitor, which is a seven uh, transmembrane protein, is a G-coupled protein that when it's activated by ADP, causes GI to be activated, which is the opposite to GS, which is inhibitory. And as a result, cyclic AMP level goes down. You have a low PKA and phosphorylation of a very important protein that is Im important for inhibiting 2B3A receptor, which is very well known to this audience, plays a major role there. So uh, the, uh, all of the drugs that are going to be discussed today have the same mechanism, and, and that is actually inhibiting P2Y12. The difference here with clopidogrel is that actually is a prodrug. So it has to be metabolized to become an active drug. <coughs> so per se, if you look at it, you guys are a winner because this drug has to be metabolized to an active drug. Now, uh, the <coughs> uh, thing is that actually about 24 to 47% of the population have no change in activity at the regular dose of 75 milligram. And 2 to 15% actually no response even to the increasing drug, to more, no matter what, how much you want to increase it. So what is the basis for that? Well, first of all, it's a very polymorphic gene. And it actually have been, 35 variants have been identified in this gene. But we know that actually three of them are the most important one. And that's actually very much helpful to us, actually, to do genotype-directed therapy. One is that actually the, uh, the star 2, which is the CYP2C19 star 2. So this is actually a cytochrome that activates the uh, plavix, so an active drug. And this star 2 actually causes a, a synonymous mutation. So no change in amino acid, but generates a cryptic splice site. As a result, the, the protein truncates and becomes inactive. This is the, one of the most common forms. The star 3 causes actually termination. It's a nonsense mutation. The protein again truncates, and there is no activity of this CYP2C19. Uh, uh, so Plavis cannot get activated if you have hom or homozygote for, for this mutation. Heterozygote is going to be 50% activation. This is actually a promoter mutation, and the protective allele actually causes increased expression. So it's protective, actually. These are super activators. These are called super activators, and the mutation is not, is not a in the coding region. Now, uh, the most common one, actually, uh, the uh, variant accounts for about 6 to 12 percent observed variability, 15 percent in Caucasian, but up to 35 percent in Asian. So there is an ethnic variability. The uh, star 3 accounts for 2 to 9 percent and is specifically in Asian population. Now, there are other variants at the star 4 to 8, but they are actually minor. Yeah, these are not very much frequent, and normally we don't measure them at all. So, and the 17 is a gain of function, increased bleeding. So as a result, actually, multiple task force actually have recommended such an algorithm that if you have super active, like 17, 17, or 1 to 17, just use a regular dose of 75 milligram. If you already, again, have a wild type allele, again, use the regular dose. If you are homozygote for reduced, you know, loss of function alleles, they suggest to use prosuchal and uh, ticagrelor. And these heterozygotes is at your discretion because it depends on the risk of bleeding of patients or versus the uh, cost and uh, also efficacy. So, you know, these are actually very complex issues that when you treat a patient, uh, it's not going to be only a genotype of C2Y19, uh, C2, uh, C2, uh, polymorphism, but patient's history, lifestyle, if they have diabetes, if they have platelet uh, uh, numbers that are varies, and all this comes into actual calculation. Practically, actually, if you want to have a very much scientific approach, it's something that actually here uh, uh, the, the David Van Dyck is using by making a neural circuit, by actually putting all this input and see, okay, what is the output going to be? Having said that, though, you are not you are far from that right now. And the question is that can we just use this genotype-directed therapy for our treatment? <coughs> Would that be sufficient? The reason is that because there are two very loss-of-function mutations that can make it very risk, change the risk quite a bit. So uh, Jennifer is going to talk about uh, that 
genotype guided prescription and two studies that actually have been conducted to see actually can we actually use it? Is it actually helpful to do genotype based therapy or is that gonna, not going to help? <coughs> Let me just mention to you that in pharma CLO, they use actually multi drug resistant genotype as well. So there is a multi drug resistance gene, which is actually in the membrane protein. And that drug actually causes also colchicine resistance, which is important for you guys to know because colchicine is becoming very favorable now these days. And this, uh, they use only the STAR2 variant. And they know STAR3. And the second study used the STAR2 and STAR3. So now, Jennifer, will you want to uh, discuss this with you? All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Mani, for the background and introduction to why the genotype is important, but also why basic science has been important in helping us understand this field. So what does this mean in terms of patient outcomes? So looking at the PharmCo study, this was a randomized controlled trial uh, using a, either a pharmacogenomic approach or a standard of care approach. And you looked at the outcomes of <coughs> bleeding, CV death, MI, non-fatal stroke, and major bleeding. And compared to standard of care arm, the pharmacogenomics arm had significantly reduced risk of MACE, 15.9% compared to 259 for the standard of care arm. There was a meta-analysis that was done looking at six randomized controlled trials of 2,300 patients, and this found that MACE was significantly reduced in patients with ACS uh, for genotype arm, and also there was significantly reduced myocardial infarction in the genotype arm, and a trend towards reduced stent thrombosis and bleeding. The other trial that was mentioned was the popular genetics. So using pharmacogenomic testing of CYP2C19 to guide antiplatelet therapy. This was also a randomized controlled trial, blinded, non-inferiority design of patients who had ACS undergoing PCI. They randomized patients to the genotyping group versus the standard treatment group, about 1,200 patients each. And we see that uh, the loss of alleles, if they had CYP2C19, STAR2, or STAR3, they were randomized to get to Cagalor or Prazogril, and if they had no variant, to Clopidogrel. And standard treatment was majority to Cagalor, 90%. The pr primary co-outcomes was death, MI, stent thrombosis, stroke, or bleeding, and the bleeding was defined by the Plato trial criteria. The slide was adapted by Dan Roden. So adverse event outcomes showed that the genotyping arm, where uh, you have majority of the patients on Plavix, actually was non-inferior compared to the standard <coughs> treatment group. Uh, and also, it had significantly reduced bleeding outcomes as well. So Dan Roden, a physician scientist who was here at Grand Rounds a couple weeks ago, uh, who was guru in pharmacogenomics research, suggested that if you don't carry STAR2 or STAR3, Plavix is the better drug. Uh, you have less thrombosis and bleeding compared to Tacragalor or Prazogrel. There's a tailored PCI trial coming out at ACC from the Mayo Clinic. It's twice the size with a similar design. And based off of what these two randomized controlled trials show, the guidelines may be changed. So what is the CYP2C19 status at YNHH? This was a pharmacogenomics pilot. We see that actually about 29% of patients have the poor or intermediate metabolizer category. So that would recommend that they switch <coughs> products. However, the other patients, a majority of the patients, actually would be amenable to use of products. So this is the overall algorithm. Once you get diagnosed with ACS requiring PCI, you would get pharmacogenomic testing. And if you're an ultra metabolizer or extensive metabolizer, Plavix is recommended, decreased risk of bleeding. Uh, if you're an intermediate, you can either go with Plavix or uh, Prazogrel or Ticagrelor. And then up on the right-hand corner are some of the contraindications to Prazogrel or Ticagrelor. So what about cost? So cost effectiveness, there was a systematic review looking at the use of pharmacogenomics because we show that there is benefit with use of pharmacogenomics in assigning an antiplatelet. We found that there were 80-something percent of these studies that showed that there was benefit and cost effectiveness for healthcare system, payer, provider, and society by doing <coughs> pharmacogenomic testing for Plavix, but not so much with warfarin. It was about 44 percent showing cost effectiveness. This is one of the genomic testing platforms available out there that was used in the PopGen study. It's a one lifetime test to see which antiplatelet would be more helpful for them. It's $104, one buccal swab, one hour test uh, will lead to your result. ActX 
provides a whole panel of genes and also drug interactions. And this one uh, takes a couple weeks for it to come back. And Plavix is what we're focused on. So here at YNHH, uh, what is the cost of doing pharmacogenomics testing and also uh, getting Plavix for a 12-month supply, which is still the one-year DAPT is recommended. So it's $37 for pharmacogenomics testing. And combine that with a 12-month supply of Plavix, your total is $197. Compare that to to Cagalore, it's like $4,700. Compare that to Prasigold, it's $360. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about is cancer risk. So this actually came out recently in discussion at the Jack Cardio Oncology Conference over the weekend. So this was something that I was not aware of, but there was analysis of cancer risk uh, in one of the answer platelets, and it was Prasigrel. <coughs> so platelet inhibition with Prasigrel significantly increased cancer risk. It was in the Triton Timmy 38. It had threefold higher risk of colonic neoplasms. VEGF is considered to be the mechanism for why that may be. It also increased risk of metastatic dissemination. There was significantly more new solid tumors diagnosed in the Prasigrel group compared to the Clopidogrel group, and also the rate of death of new cancers was significantly higher in the Prasigrel group. And this was still persistent even after the data from the cancers diagnosed by bleeding was removed from the study. So that is something that we'll need to explore more. Additional data is going to be needed. So this is a summary slide. Overall, Plavix is an antiplatelet that enables for precision medicine. Our goal is to try to make sure our patients have the best outcome possible. Plavix uh, wins on all these parameters. It's reduced costs, it's daily dosing, pharmacogenomics approach, which will allow you to tailor the antiplatelet to make sure they reach that sweet spot of anticoagulation without increased bleeding risk. It also has decreased bleeding risk. It's not discontinued as much as the Cagalor due to symptoms of shortness of breath and bleeding. And cancer risk, that's something still on the docket, but that needs further exploration. So I want to thank everyone that, uh, here coming here for this session, including uh, Yale cardiology <coughs> leaders, mentors, Dr. Armani, uh, Drs. Miller and Gandhi, or all the co-fellows, and then also uh, to our wonderful pharmacist, Ralph Riello, uh, Segun, and also Rebecca for uh, some of their slides that I use. Thank you very much. Okay, so I had the pleasure of talking to you this morning about Ticagalor, which I like to call the Cadillac of antiplatelet agents. Um, so first talking about the mechanism of action, Jenna got into a little bit, um, but Ticagalor is a cyclopentyl triazolopyrimidine, which is a selective <coughs> P2Y12 inhibitor. Um, Half-life is 7 to 12 hours, which is why it requires twice daily dosing. Um, it's an active drug in contrast to the thionopyridines, or the thionopyridines, and it's also a reversible P2Y12 inhibitor as opposed to the irreversible inhibition of the thionopyridines. Um, so Ticagalor sort of uh, made a splash with the PLATO trial in 2009. Over 18,000 patients with ACS were randomized to clopidogrel or Ticagrelor. Um, and the primary endpoint was death from vascular causes, MI or stroke. And as most of us know, um, there was a significant decrease, um, almost 2% absolute risk reduction in the Ticagrelor group, has a ratio of 0.84, which was highly statistically significant. Um, and here is the Kaplan-Meier curve showing you the separation relatively early in the trial and continuing up until 12 months of follow-up. Secondary endpoints included um, individual components of the composite endpoint, so lower risk of MI, lower risk of death from vascular causes, and all-cause mortality. And then stroke was not significantly different between the two groups. In terms of safety endpoints, uh, major bleeding overall was not statistically significant between the two groups. Um, however, when you excluded cabbage-related major bleeding, there was a signal. Um, so here are the Kaplan-Meier curves, excuse me, for the overall major bleeding. No difference there at 12 months. But uh, major bleeding without um, including that from cabbage was slightly higher in the Ticagrelor group um, due to its higher platelet inhibition. Um, one sort of caveat that came out of the PLATO trial was the signal towards possible regional variation. Um, you'll see that North America, as opposed to the other three regions, had this sort of signal towards uh, clopidogrel being better. Um, and so th there was a question as to why this might be the case. 
there was a paper that looked into possible reasons, and basically one thing they found was that given the number of subgroup analyses that were performed with the trial, the risk or the risk of finding a positive finding was relatively high. So one in three chance that they would find a positive signal. So chance alone remains a significant um, possibility as to why this was found. But they also noted there was a significant discrepancy in aspirin dosing between the two regions. So more than half the patients had a high aspirin dosing in the United States, more than 300 milligrams per day, whereas in the rest of the world it was less than 2%. When they reanalyzed the data clustered by aspirin dosing, um, the f uh, trend in, tr in favor of ticagavir was even higher with low-dose aspirin, um, while with higher-dose um, aspirin, it was favored clopidogrel, which is why the FDA has since um, made the recommendation that all patients on ticagavir should be on less than 100 milligrams a day of aspirin. Um, and for this reason, as we know, um, ticagavir has a uh, class one indication for post-PCI patients in STEMI, also class one indication um, for at least 12 months in post-PCI patients with, uh, who've had NSTEMI, also indicated for medical therapy for those treated medically, um, and in preference to clopidogrel in those who undergo either PCI or medical, um, medical management. Uh, in terms of cost effectiveness, so using Play-Doh data, it's been shown in multiple contexts that Ticagua is considered to be cost effective. Um, this analysis only included those um, taking low-dose aspirin in the U.S. because that would be the um, context it'd be used in going forward given the FDA recommendations. Um, and even with the higher cost that Jennifer rec or, uh, referred to, um, the uh, point estimate was less than $30,000 a year uh, per <coughs> quality adjusted life year. Um, and 99% of their estimates fell under the commonly accepted threshold of less than 100,000 per quality adjusted life year. Looking at other contexts, in Canada, you'll notice it's much cheaper to get health care in Canada, um, and 99% of their bootstrap estimates fell under 30,000 per quality adjusted life year. That's in Canadian dollars, no less. Um, <laughs> uh, and then looking at other contexts, too, in Sweden, life or healthcare is very cheap, um, and Ticagor is highly cost effective. Same with Germany. Um, and actually, one thing those authors noted was if you assume you're using branded Plavix as opposed to generic Plavix, <coughs> Ticagor is actually cheaper, not just cost effective, it's actually cheaper. Um, and then Australia as well. Again, this is on Australian dollars. But even if Clopidogrel is considered to be free, Ticagor was considered highly cost effective. Um, so now uh, I wanted to go through several other contexts in which we've seen Ticagor being um, useful. Um, one of them is the Pegasus Timmy 54 trial. So this was in patients who had had sort of more remote MIs one to three years prior to this trial. The median was uh, 1.7 years, and they had been discontinued from DAPT with no plans to continue dual antiplatelet therapy. So there was more than 21,000 <coughs> patients randomized to one of two doses of Ticagrelor or placebo for sort of secondary prevention ongoing of um, adverse cardiac events with the primary endpoint of cardiovascular death, MI, or stroke. The rate of this event in placebo group was 9%, um, and significantly lower with the low-dose ticagrelor with a hazard ratio of 0.84, and again, significantly lower with the ticagrelor 90 milligram dose. The primary safety endpoint was Timmy major bleeding, which was higher um, in the ticagrelor group, but as to be expected, if you're inhibiting platelets, people are going to bleed more. There were exploratory analyses looking at uh, individual uh, components of the composite endpoint, uh, lower risk of MI in both doses of ticagrelor and the pooled cohort. Uh, and then for stroke, there was a signal towards lower risk in the low-dose ticagrelor, but significant difference in both the high-dose ticagrelor and pooled analysis. Uh, Twilight is another trial I wanted to go over. So this is looking at, can we stop aspirin um, soon after PCI? So this is patients um, who had received PCI and were given dual antiphilic <coughs> therapy with ticagrelor and aspirin for three months. If they didn't have a bleeding event during that time, they were eligible to uh, continue in the trial and they would continue ticagrelor at 90 milligrams twice a day and then they were randomized to either aspirin for 12 months or placebo for 12 months, more than 7,000 patients <coughs> you see there, with a primary endpoint of um, BARC type 2, 3, or 5 bleeding, and a secondary ischemic endpoint to make sure that we're not 
causing more adverse events by stopping aspirin early. So the primary bleeding endpoint saw a significantly lower percentage in the placebo group with a hazard ratio of 0.56. And here are the curves. You can see they diverge relatively early, uh, looks like a month into the trial, and continue to diverge further up to the 12-month follow-up point. Um, and in the ischemic endpoint, there was no significant difference, um, easily met the threshold for non-inferiority. So now we see ticagrelor in this um, potential context using as, as monotherapy um, to reduce risk of bleeding um, in high-risk patients undergoing PCI. And then finally, I wanted to go over treat. Um, one thing we often don't think about in our context is that uh, there's many parts of the world where lytics are still standard of care for STEMI uh, because many patients live in remote areas where access to a PCI center just isn't possible. Um, so this trial looked at the safety of ticagrelor after people receive lytics in the setting of a STEMI. Almost 3,800 patients in 10 countries. Um, and they were randomized to receive clopidogrel or ticagrelor. And it should be noted that about 90% of them received clopidogrel um, loading prior to lytics, and then were transferred to a higher level of care where then they were randomized in this trial. So it's really looking at the safety of crossover from clopidogrel. And the primary endpoint was timmy major, timmy major bleeding at 30 days with no significant difference, easily meeting the non-inferiority goal. So um, I wanted to preempt my colleague a little bit who's coming up, Catherine Clark. Uh, uh, regarding prasugrel, I just wanted to note that these are a few things that we don't have issues with with ticagrelor. Um, there's class three indication that prasugrel causes harm in the setting of uh, patients who've had stroke or TIA, so that it is not to be used then. And also for patients who are undergoing cabbage, prasugrel has a longer washout period. Um, again, black box warning from the FDA shouldn't be used or used with caution in patients over 75 and don't use in patients who've had stroke or TIA. So everyone's talking about the ISAR REACT trial, which came out last fall. It appears that prasugrel may be superior to ticagrelor. Um, they used a primary endpoint of death, MI, and stroke at one year, with prasugrel having a lower incidence of this endpoint with a hazard ratio of 1.36 and a highly significant P value, and uh, no difference in the primary or the safety endpoint of bark major bleeding. But I have a few problems with this trial, <laughs> maybe more than a few. Um, one of them is it's open label design, so neither patients nor providers were blinded to treatment. Um, and this was a big one, is that the events were primarily obtained through telephone contact with patients. So only 10% of patients were followed up in person, either in the hospital or an outpatient visit, whereas 83% were contacted over the phone, and then a further 7% were only contacted via, via a structured letter, which is pretty um, unusual for landmark trials that we would uh, change care based off of. Another caveat is that 19% of the patients were discharged from the index hospitalization without trial drug. Um, and then another 12 to 15% discontinued within the follow-up period of 12 months. So a third of patients not taking the medication um, at follow -up, uh, final follow-up. And then again, the safety endpoint, which showed no difference in bleeding between the two groups. Um, there was a much higher number of patients excluded from the prasugrel group compared to ticagrelor, um, more than 10 times, or yeah, more than 10 times the uh, number. And the authors didn't really offer any explanation for why this was the case, either in the paper or any of the supplemental material, which obviously could um, be masking uh, some bleeding events that were missing. So in summary, um, ticagrelor is superior to clopidogrel in multiple contexts, and has also been shown useful in many um, patient situations, including post-PCI and medically managed, which prasugrel is not, does not have indication for. Um, we've seen that it's safe as monotherapy after three months of dual NF platelet therapy, also non-inferior to clopidogrel um, post-lytics in the setting of STEMI, cost-effective in multiple countries compared to clopidogrel, lacks the black box warning of prasugrel, and while ISAR reacts raises some important questions, it has many, many problems. <laughs> uh, thanks to Dr. Henry for his mentorship, and I'll uh, yield the floor to Catherine. Okay, good morning, everybody. Now I'm gonna round out the bait and talk about Prasugrel. 
So the <laughs> historical context is important for the use of these drugs. So I'm briefly going to bring us through the past decade. In 2007, Triton Timmy was published in 13,000 patients with moderate to high risk ACS with a scheduled PCI were randomized to receive either prasugrel or clopidogrel and continued for six to 15 months. They found that prasugrel was superior in reducing the composite cardiovascular endpoint after ACS, which was primarily driven by a reduction in the incidence of recurrent MIs, but it did occur at the expense of an increased risk of bleeding. Thus, it was concluded that prasugrel is factor at faster acting, more potent, and more consistent. The primary endpoint occurred in 12.1% of patients receiving clopidogrel and only 9.9% .9 of patients receiving prasugrel, which was statistically significant. They also found significant reductions in the prasugrel group in rates of recurrent MIs, urgent PCIs, and stent thrombosis. However, major bleeding was observed in 2.4% of patients receiving prasugrel and 1.8% of those receiving clopidogrel. Then, in 2009, prasugrel enters the market. It was developed by a Japanese company, approved in Europe in early 2009, and then later that year in the U.S., and it was marketed through Eli Lilly uh, and company. Even in 2010, Studies demonstrated that prasugrel, although more expensive up front, was economically attractive. Briefly, in a prospective study in eight countries, a population of almost 7,000 patients was studied. Hospitalization costs were estimated from DRGs, and life expectancy was estimated from in-trial events with statistical modeling. They found that over about 14 months, the total cost was an average of about $220 less for those patients who received prasugrel. Again, largely due to a lower rate of rehospitalization involving PCI. They also, interestingly, found a small life expectancy gain due to fewer non fatal MIs. Then, at that time, in addition, as Dr. Reinhardt discussed, Plato was published in 2009 and Ticagrelor was FDA approved in 2011. And to incorporate these pivotal trials, there was a focused update to the guidelines including prasugrel and ticagrelor as a class one recommendation for patients with ACS and a planned PCI. Following incorporation of these drugs into clinical practice, there were numerous studies comparing the agents, as both of my colleagues have discussed. But some were not randomized. They were retrospective, and the choice of antiplatelet was largely unknown and to the discretion of the individual clinician, making the data quite challenging to interpret. Briefly, I include here two studies from the past several years that demonstrate that both prasugrel and ticagrelor were superior to clopidogrel, but actually the comparative effectiveness of the two newer agents has remained largely unknown. Then, just last this September, ISAR REACT was published, creating a potential sea change in the field. This was the first head-to-head -head randomized trial comparing ticagrelor and prasugrel. As I'll discuss, prasugrel was found to be superior, and in addition, there was no significant difference in major bleeding. It was a randomized, multi-center, open-label trial in Germany, and just over 4,000 patients who were admitted with ACS and planned PCI were randomized, with about 2,000 in each group. STEMI patients, as well as NSTEMI, unstable angina, were included. In the STEMI arm, either med was loaded, and then patient underwent PCI. In the NSTEMI group, it was almost a head to set head, as those who were randomized to Prasquil received it after PCI, and only if getting a PCI. The authors noted they had good compliance, as medications were free in Germany, and there was actually fairly little loss to follow up. And then results were obtained in one year. In Paris, when this was presented at the ESC, the investigators noted that they were surprised, for the trial was in fact designed expecting that ticagrelor would be superior. And the authors continue to reiterate this in later interviews. But in fact, they found just the opposite. This also argues against bias as a potential confounder. The primary endpoint, composite of death, 
MI stroke was lower at 6.9% for patients who received prasugrel compared to 9.3% in the ticagrelor group. And the benefits were directionally concordant against all subgroups. In addition, secondary outcomes of death and major bleeding were also lower in the prasugrel patients. These surprising results occurred despite a lower than expected event rate and a sizable percentage of patients who received con conservative therapy, which is about 14%. Here we can see the Kaplan-Meier curve for the primary endpoint, clearly demonstrating the superior of, uh, superiority of prasugrel. Now seeing these results, we can simply go back to the pharmacodynamics to explain the difference. Prasugal causes irreversible plate inhibition for the whole life of the platelet, which isn't affected by missed doses. So it's at a constant 70% of inhibition of platelet aggregation, which is above the threshold to theoretically develop an MI. For ticagrelor, however, platelet inhibition is proportionate to drug plasma levels. So there's a transient recovery of platelet function. So a missed dose can cause an issue and create a temporary inadequate antithrombotic milieu. As an important detail of the study, a dose reduction helped to unmask the beneficial effects of prasugrel. Given the results of Triton Timmy, as Dr. Reinhardt mentioned, the <coughs> investigators appropriately used a reduced maintenance dose of prasugrel in patients who were older than 75 and those who weighed less than 60 kilos. <coughs> they also excluded patients with history of cerebrovascular events, the population that had um, adverse events in Triton Timmy. However, this dose was never formally studied. In terms of the safety endpoint, there was no statistical difference in major bleedings between the two groups, and this analysis was performed in a modified intention to treat population. Another notable observation from the study was the favorable side effect profile of prasugrel. Patients who received ticagrelor stopped the medication earlier and more frequently than patients who received prasugrel, from 15.2% to 12.5%. And about 3% of those discharged with prasugrel, uh, with ticagrelor stopped it due to shortness of breath. Again, thanks to Ralph and our pharmacy team, we know that Jen had mentioned as well, um, in 2018, about a third of our patients who were admitted with ACS um, and started on ticagrelor switched for various reasons. And again, to highlight, the dyspnea was the top reason at 45%, and cost was about another quarter. In addition, we likely underestimate the cost of the following workup for this dyspnea, uh, which often includes stress tests, echoes, in addition to just stopping the medication. So today, Prasugrel has several important practical considerations. There's fewer side effects. There's no adenosine-related dyspnea, no conduction issues, bradycardia. There's no metabolism issues. It's only a one-step activation, as Plavix is two. It's once daily dosing, compared to ticagrelor, which is dosed twice a day, making it more challenging for patients. There's good Medicare coverage uh, for Prasugrel, and copays are usually about less than $17 a month. And then it's generic and widely available. For Yale-affiliated hospitals uh, and pharmacies, Prasugrel is $18 a month versus Ticagrelor, a whopping $116 a month for patients. Again, in 2019, it's been showed that the, shown that the increased upfront drug cost compared to clopidogrel is offset by lower resource utilization from improved outcomes. In this study, briefly, they looked at 70,000 patients from a database of 130 million commercially insured patients in the US from 2009 to 2013, over six months after an ACS admission, and costs were assessed via claims paid. This, again, was driven by a decreased event, uh, rate in cardiovascular events, but they found no significant difference between the two newer agents. So who wouldn't take this MD's advice? <laughs> so today, with the available evidence, Prasugrel is simply the superior choice. As I was taught over and over in business school, there's the iron triangle of healthcare, quality, cost, and access. 
And we ideally want to achieve all three with our treatments, but in reality, this is quite challenging. So in summary for Prasigril, it improves quality as it's the most effective in preventing recurrent MIs and cardiovascular adverse events. There's good access as it's generic and very well covered by Medicare, which we all know is a growing and very sizable population. And lastly, it's cost effective and decreased resource utilization, the true triple aim of healthcare. So I wanted to thank everybody. I wanted to thank Dr. Brennan for my mentor, thank the other co-fellows, thank Ralph and his pharmacy team for all their Yale-specific information, and then thank everybody and open the floor to some questions. So just as a brief summary, we've heard a lot of data, an incredible <laughs> amount of data, an incredible amount of trials. Jennifer and Aria presented uh, pharmacokinetics as well as genomic data, which, uh, you know, sort of sometimes in the heat of the moment, we don't actually have time to get genomic data uh, to decide on the appropriate antiplatelet agent. Sam and Glenn, should you have any comments, have, have spoken about Ticagrelor, or uh, and then Catherine has actually summed it up with Prasigril. What is probably the most important is obviously effectiveness, compliance, cost, uh, all the way around, as Catherine has summed up in her final triangle there in, in access. I'm going to ask Ralph Riello, who's the CCU pharmacist and has always been a strong uh, advocate for things that we do in the CCU, to sort of help me a little bit, because obviously there's a ton of data out there and what is the best option that we currently have. Our algorithmic approach to this since the 2011 ACC uh, AHA guidelines has that been that in all of our associated hospitals and our referral networks, Ticagrelor is the go-to drug. It had been the go-to drug in the algorithms that have been put out there. Should we change that based on available data? Another, another confounding variable is obviously going to be the use of dual antiplatelets, including aspirin. Uh, that is out there now, particularly with newer stent designs. So I, I told Alf just about three minutes ago that I was going to pick on him. So I, I think he's up for it. You know. Yeah, okay. So, hey guys, I'm Ralph in the CCU. Uh, <laughs> heard, heard me mention a lot today, I guess. Everybody hit me up for some slides. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, honestly, congrats to our fellows. I think it's really compelling arguments for all three agents. Um, I could just want to underscore some of those salient points that, that this is a really good example for precision-based medicine. Um, and, and really for us to have these kind of shared decision-making conversations about what PTY12 inhibitor is best for the patient in front of you um, represents kind of how far we've gone since just using aspirin monotherapy, just using lytics, just using uh, Plavix alone, um, and then to DAPT. So um, the fact that we're thinking about this and asking what the 340B price is or looking at pharmacogenomics, um, it represents a really good discussion ultimately to the benefit of the patient. Um, Joe was absolutely right. Our algorithms right now do give preferential use to Berlinta based on the comparative Plato trial. And we haven't really had time in the medical community, I don't think, to digest all of the ISAR React um, information with some of the concerns um, that Sam did share, I think appropriately so. Um, knowing that Joe Brennan wants to save all the Medicare dollars for him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Prasigril now being uh, generic does. Uh, uh, plus the benefit in ISAR React uh, probably would, would lend a lot of people to think maybe switching to that instead of going all the way to Plavix um, if Berlinta cost considerations do come up. Um, but this is a discussion we have every day on rounds. Uh, the unsung heroes in the quality improvement pharmacy department actually check the copay at the counter cost prior to discharge for everybody who started on antiplatelet agent. Um, that information is posted to the chart and, and discussed with the patient, coupon cards are made available to them. Uh, we don't want cost to be the issue, but unfortunately, sometimes it is uh, one of the reasons why we have to transition away. Um, so I, uh, if you find yourself in the, the grips of, of tackling, maybe picking just one agent, um, try and think of those niche special populations where the data may have been more compelling for one or the other. Um, if your patient fits one of those, that's great. Uh, but ultimately, you have to ask the patient what they're willing to, uh, to take and remain adherent to in the outpatient setting. So um, I'm going to cop out and not pick one for the answer. Um, but I, I think that you guys all presented good arguments and, and just make the one that's right for the patient in front of you. Thank you, Ralph. Sorry about the last note. <laughs> last minute notice of telling you I'm going to put you on the spot. And Glenn, any comment for, on Ticagrelor? As the genetic, as a member of the genetic team, I would advocate that 
we are going to see more and more 2C19 data in our population. As our biobank ramps up, we're about to get 800 people's information back. 2C19 is part of the first one. So that information will be available more and more at the point of decision making. Um, it will have start two and start three right now. Um, as we mentioned, the CPIC guideline is from 2013. <coughs> I do expect the update that is currently in progress to address over metabolizers, so the star 17, star 17s, will probably have a caution for clopidogrel. Um, we also know that there are a number of uh, variants that are important to our patients of African descent. <coughs> Um, that are not covered right now by STAR-2 or STAR-3. So as we know more and as we add more, we will be able to tailor to the individual people. Is that re readily available a point of care, which becomes Correct. sort of an urgent issue? So <clears throat> it is. Um, so part of the reason why we have not transitioned to um, the short turnaround testing is because it is not possible to integrate that information into the electronic medical the way we are testing right now, everything is directly integrated into the electronic medical record. It is available as a tab. If the patient has that information and you are in an encounter view, um, it also does medication um, checking at the point of ordering. So if you order clopidogrel and someone has information on file that shows that they would be not a preferential responder, it will alert you to not use that medication and select something different. Um, the one thing our system does not do yet um, is drug-drug gene interactions. So the one thing that I do caution people is that our strongest evidence is for those poor metabolizers who carry two loss of functions. If you carry one loss of function and you're on something like a PPI that also inhibits the enzyme, you are at greater risk. You act more like a poor metabolizer. Um, that is something that we aren't able to, to do signaling with the uh, the BPAs right now, but it will be coming. Perfect, thank you. Martha. Uh, three brief clinically oriented questions. Number one, in patients who are on a NOAC for atrial fibrillation, how many interventionalists would prefer clopidogrel for a lower bleed risk rather than an alternative agent? Number two, in the appropriate patient, how many interventionalists are discharging patients on prasugrel today? And number three, in patients we are considering longer term death therapy at one year, how many people change ticagrelor to clopidogrel for a lower long term bleed risk? So I guess those are meant for me. Uh, yes. So I can jump in. Glenn, you want me to jump in? So, um, you know, in, in deference to everything here, it was a great topic and it's a great debate, but like most debates, there's no clear winner. Um, and as many people have alluded to, we need to pick based on individual preferences. In terms of the DOAC, and I would caution people not to write NOAC because it's no AC, and sometimes that's been transcribed as no anticoagulation in the patient, so please be careful with the phrasing there. Um, I think most of us feel pretty comfortable discharging patients straight out on a DOAC and a thionopyridine. Uh, I don't think we've included aspirin in that regimen anymore as the standard of care. Um, the standard of care is continually changing as stents have continually changed and become much thinner struts with better biocompatible polymers and drug elution characteristics. As you saw on most of those slides, the separation between two drugs generally occurs within the first month, and it's about a 2% difference or a number needed to treat of about 50. After that time frame, it seems that all three drugs are pretty much relatively similar. Um, and there has been studies looking at just changing patients to clopidogrel <coughs> at the one month mark, which seems to have equivalent outcomes. Um, the other thing that wasn't mentioned is the fourth component in our debate, which is aspirin. Um, and it may be that a year from now, we're actually debating whether we even need to continue aspirin in these patients after the one-time load at the time of the procedure. So Arthur, based on the data Ralph has provided me uh, yesterday, 5% uh, are discharged on Prasigrel from the hospital. It's the lowest 
quite a significant difference. Most go home on either clopidogrel or ticagrelor. And if the patient is on a DOAC, is the preference to use clopidogrel over the other two drugs? I haven't seen that. I don't know if you have, but I, I would not use some prasigrel yeah. because of the bleeding signal, but I don't think there's much difference between ticagrelor and clopidogrel. Um, so I ran the data though on Plavix, DOAC mm -hmm. and Plavix. I mean, do we have, I, I don't know the answer. Do we have data on DOAC yes. and ticagrelor? So we do, Rachel. We have actually have a lot of data because it's becoming a much more common occurrence with the individuals now presenting on a DOAC. Uh, and it's acute coronary syndrome. Some of those trials have used uh, DOAC regimens that none of us are used to, to be honest with you. So there is some difficulty with extrapolation of those. Uh, I think that, to Arthur's question, I don't know this specifically, but I think that the interventional group is sort of using, sort of deciding on an individual basis if they're on Ticago or do they go home on that, the DOAC or the clopidogrel. Some, most people are probably going home on COVID. And I did do that data poll, so that was my design. It was by far and away the majority of people were going home on COVID girl. It was um, 70 to 80 percent not perhaps girl, or not to take girl. I mean, that data is pretty straightforward. <coughs> that Plavix is, right, right. But the dosing of the DOAX actually is very quite variable, too, in a number of the trials that they use it. Barry. Uh, little mention was made of uh, the antacid interaction. Uh, are there data on the pharmacokinetics and uh, that would say that you can use it uh, in, for a certain period of time or genomics? So there's a little. Um, it is also, so originally when we started having intermediate metabolizers, a lot of the studies, Vanderbilt, Florida, um, that did the early implementation of genomic guided clopidogrel used a double dose of clopidogrel to force. Um, the enzyme to produce more of the active metabolite. What they found as we've gone along is so many of our patients now have diabetes and that has effects on platelets that they no longer recommend that doubling the clopidogrel group dose to force through the enzyme as being something. The other thing with drug-drug interactions, especially with the PPIs, is they're not necessarily quantifiable. Um, they're not, we don't necessarily have um, the range at which they can reduce the dose of the drugs. Um, so how I teach my residents is if you are at a specific metabolism status and you have an inhibitor, you go down one, um, but that is the average. It is still a bell-shaped curve like they showed up on the clopidogrel slides of drug response and enzyme activity. Um, so you don't know where on that curve the patient started or where the inhibitor pushed them to. Um, so it is somewhat of a moving target. The other thing that would note is that in our pilot study, we still had a number of people who were poor metabolizers on clopidogrel and had no events in our follow-up period. And so that is still, we don't exactly know what's going on. I would argue that as stents have gotten better, the delta effect of adding a P2Y12 to aspirin has gotten smaller. And so we're not seeing the huge effects that we once did. So, so Ralph, from a clinical perspective, this is probably the last question. From a clinical perspective, is, is that important? That interaction. The, so they're talking about the antacid and and like clopidogrel. Yeah. So this I found it's really unique. It's still taught. I I, I feel almost incorrectly in medical schools and pharmacy schools uh, all across the country. It's like this dogma of uh, using omeprazole, so Prilosec PPI over the counter, um, which is a moderate CYP2C19 inhibitor, um, which we learned is the two-step bioactivation enzyme for Plavix. Um, so it was given like black box warning contraindication initially to never combine those two, and it's very still taught that way. Um, but when they actually put this to test in a randomized controlled trial called Cogent, um, it was it was Plavix by itself, well part of dual blood therapy for ACS patients plus Plavix plus that PPI in a combo pill. And not only was there no difference in major adverse cardiovascular events between the two arms, but there's actually a lower risk of gastrointestinal bleeding in the PPI arm. And I'm the last person to advocate for using a PPI um, risk of C. diff, notwithstanding, which is part of our Christmas bonus coming up <laughs> next year, by the way. Um, so, <laughs> keep that in mind. Part um, of the issue with these studies, though, is that they weren't stratified by genomic status. Mm -hmm. So the work that I did at Geisinger showed that there was actually almost a, like a two-fold two increase in mortality if you had a PPI on, PPI on 
with the little girl and you kind of reduce the function. The base function, no. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you for a very good <laughs>